Welcome to Korea News Talk being streamed live on August 20th, 2011. This is a collaborative effort between Korea Business Central and KoreaBridge.net, uh, a periodic discussion of what's been happening in Korea. In the past, we've kind of focused on business. We're experimenting with broadening the range of topics uh, to other non-business things, although most of our stories today are business-related, as we'll be talking about the recent economic downturn across the globe and here in Korea, some union news and some stories of companies doing business uh, here in Korea and some of the challenges they have faced. With us today, this is Jeff Lebo. I'm in Pusan. Uh, Adam Cave. I'm in Pusan, Professor of Management at Kyungsung University. My name is Charles, and I'm right now in Seoul, and I am a, I'm the faculty manager at the Changdam Institute in Pyongyang. And I'm Stafford Lumsden, a columnist and part-time blogger, as well as teacher here in Seoul. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks to our live uh, viewers. So the t lead story, uh, we actually put this together last week, and at that time it was entitled the uh, U.S. Debt ceiling issue and now it's kind of morphed into global economic downturn or catastrophe looming uh, <laughs> and its effect crash. on Korea. Uh, to frame this issue for us, Adam, what's what's going on? Well, I mean, as everybody knows, I'm sure, like the Standard & Poor's stepped in and downgraded the U.S. Uh, credit rating to what double A plus and you know that's due to a lot to the Republicans and the Democrats can't get their uh, organization together. But the interesting note for the rest of us, I mean, some of us are a little bit more in tune with America watching that happen, but then seeing it go global across the world, seeing how, you know, all the interconnectedness of, of the economy and whatever has started to hit everywhere else. So the Cosby took a took a hit, you know, the COSDAC took a hit as well, and, uh, you know, for, for most of us, we're really concerned trying to figure out what happened. So how has it played out here in Korea? Um, for the most part, I mean... The market did dip close to 10% back last week, and that was a very big, big hit for all of us. Um, all the major companies, as you know, even the blue, the big emperor, you know, the emperor uh, share, emperor share, the the Samsung Corporation, that the Samsung Electronics, even they took a hit. I mean, they were down close to what 30% uh, in value. I know that at one point back, I want to say earlier in the summer, they were up to one point something million won per share. But now I know that they're they're barely. I think it's what like seven, something like that. Wow. And in and general, the from the peak yeah. a few weeks ago, the Dow dropped, I believe, fourteen percent. The Kospi dropped eighteen percent. Yeah. Um, is is this just connected to well, America's not going to grow as much and consume as much Korean products, or are there deeper underlying concerns about you know? I, I saw statistics also on household debt. And apparently, Korea is leading the way in, yes. in household debt among developed countries. And also that some banks are, because of that, starting to tighten loan. Tighten their, right. <clears throat> um, the thing is, with the, with the market, as you know, investors are always going to be looking, because it's all based on speculation. And so um, investors are always thinking, like, let's think, what's going to happen with this? Is it gonna, Is it going to cause a ripple effect? And of course, uh, with the U.S. economy the way it is, um, as a exporting nation, if they're not buying up enough products, I mean, look at the won. It was appreciating against the dollar, and and I mean, we're an exporting nation, and then all of a sudden our exports have to get pricier, more expensive, and then all of a sudden now we've got this economic downturn, which means U.S. might not be able to buy up a lot of our products, but also now our goods have gone up in price. And so now it's like, hey, what's going on? And then I understand why the Bank of Korea did that. They did raise interest rates so that they can try to curb inflation and the consumer prices right in Korea. But also it hurt us and it hurt our export market just because, you know, the way our won has appreciated against the dollar. And so, I mean, there's some of some of the uh, economists are predicting that, you know, it's going to go well, it's going to go down, actually. It's going to be close to maybe even break a thousand won. But right now with the situation that, you know, the possibility of a double dip or going back into recession, I mean, this might, you know, send it, and we don't know, actually, it's going to yeah. make the market very volatile, yeah. and it's just going to yeah. jump up and down where wherever the investors are thinking. And then with the foreign investors, you know, dumping all of their shares and leaving the Kospi, right now, this is going to drop the market even lower, because right now, you know, we, we need the foreign investors to, and have and confidence in our market, in our in our exports. 
and you know at all the markets that we have right now in Korea. But if if the investors are thinking this is not it and they start dumping the shares, I mean the market's gonna go down. Everybody's gonna jump ship. When it, it's they're all gonna jump ship. Even I'm thinking, hey, you know what? If it dips any more than this, I have to start selling my shares or I'm gonna be taking a hit. I mean that's probably not the best solution because the more we get collective and more we bond together and we start thinking as a whole, then we could probably be able to pick up the market together. But I mean, all human beings with their own money, they're all very, you know, they all work in their self-interest. And so, you know, I've got my money in there. Somebody else has got their money in there. All of a sudden, no, I don't, I don't really mind about that guy's money. I'm really worried about my money. So I'll jump ship, jump dump all my shares, which will drive my, our company stock prices even lower. And the other guy's going to start selling his. And so the whole market starts to, you know, go up and down. And so it might cause a very big problem in the long run. Oh, very true. And it's not just the problem in America, too. I mean, the ongoing issues in the EU haven't allowed to have a secondary market, right? I mean, if you jump it, uh, America has problems, fine, let's go to the EU. Well, yeah, it's not <laughs> working so well because there's too many, you know, Italy and Greece and, you know, some of the other issues talking about devaluing the euro. You know, so there's no other market to go to either. So right, and you've got awesome. countries that are potentially, you know, defaulting now, and so we've got that as an issue. Mm, absolutely. So yeah, you know, I get the sense when I watch the volatility in the American markets that mom and pop investor are the ones who sell it on the way down, and the institutions are the ones who buy it on the way up. <laughs> Is there any sense of that happening in Korea as well? Um. With the big movements, I mean, as you know, I'm sure, you know, little mom, mom and pop, and like you said, I mean, even if you want to put Charles in there, that's fine. Like, <laughs> no matter how many times I dump my shares, it's not going to move the market that much. However, yes, it is the big hands that have really, really moved the market. They'll be buying it and selling it, like, in big lump sums. And so, yes, yeah, that'll be driving up the market or be dump, that'll be driving down the market. And so, yeah, it, I think we're the ones taking... Uh, a loss by selling it, but then when they pick it up, I mean, then you're like, oh, I should have held on to that stock. <clears throat> I mean, even if you take a look, when the Dow Jones took a, what is it, like a 400, 500 point dip, I mean, after the news that the U.S. were going to set their interest rates practically pretty much at zero, I mean, the market did rebound, and then with that news, the Korean market rebounded. And so, it, I think it's just a matter of time. I think we just have to play it out because I think people are just very worried and very scared with their mom taking it and trying to put it in. So they're backing it up with something else. Like, you know, I'm backing some of my money up and come out and come, like silver, metal, and yeah. silver and gold. And, and now so, the U.S. I government's mean, trying to discredit S&P, right? I mean, right. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> it's not even the United States. I mean, I mean, yes, you've got the federal government, but you've got the state government now. Uh, California decided to dump, uh, drop S&P as their credit reader. Oh, wow. Okay, I didn't How much that, do you think so. this is really because of the downgrade? I mean, it seems to me that it's really fundamentals that are behind a lot of this. I mean, as soon as they did the downgrade and people panicked with their money, the first thing they bought were U.S. bonds. <laughs> <laughs> kind of ironic, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But the fact is the United States is not, the economy is not growing. And they're talking right. double dip recession there. And the EU has their problems. How about China? Aside from sort of saying, see, this is what you naughty American capitalists get. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was this... definitely a question I was going to ask in that, you know, it, China plays a big role in holding a lot of U.S. debt. But also, obviously, it's, it's a direct neighbor to Korea. What, what does China do in terms of affecting the Korean market? Korean market, China is Korea's number one market for the last, I think, the last year or two years. Uh, Korea has been really deep, the whole country, all the major industries that I've worked with, they're all really starting to see China as the next America in terms of selling their products. Um, even at a very basic societal level, some children are not learning English anymore. Some children are actually learning Chinese. The Chinese hog ones are starting to open up also. Uh, I think the biggest problem, to go back to the financial issue, you, you talked about all different day-to-day -day stuff. I look at a very structural problem. S&P, when I was reading the uh, why the, Fed, the feds are really investigating S&P is because of the conflict of interest. You get you pay me and then I'll give you a good thing. I'll give you a good rating for your all your toxic mortgages. That's 
that's who should have been hit first because S and P, S and P, and all the other rating agencies, they all said those mortgages were top notch vehicles, and they weren't. It was pure garbage. That's that's why I think. And then the whole Wall Street, the Dow Jones, back in two thousand, it was a non profit organization. If if you can believe that, it was a non profit organization. But in two thousand, early two thousand, they switched it to a profit company, a for profit company. And when you get a for profit company in the biggest greed area of the world, what happens? Ethics goes out the window awful quick. And I think that's those two things really destroyed the American market. And I think the only way to come back to it is make Wall Street into a non-profit again, make all the exchanges non-profit again, because all the exchanges have become for-profit enterprises. They don't care about anybody else. At the core, they don't care about anybody else anymore because they're for-profit. It's all about them. So that's why there's the major two major issues yeah. that I, I look at in, in this in this context. Number one, what we we're talking about earlier, China is really becoming Korea's uh, land of opportunity. Number two, Wall Street. They got to go back to what they were before two thousand. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, just to add to um, what Daniel was saying, actually. Back even when Korea was, you know, when we were hit with IMF back in the 1990s, um, I know that, you know, I, I really feel like it's this, this concept of unity. Um, I was actually having a conversation with my girlfriend yesterday about this. Why is the U.S. in the current situation that they're in? And why did Korea, why were we able to rebound from the economic crisis that we had? Um, and actually, they called it, uh, they, were, they actually had a movement where they asked the citizens to sell all their gold. Uh, back in the 90s, and Korea, all the citizens said, oh, you know what, if the government needs our gold, let's dump it. Even if we take a hit, let's do it. Let's bond together. Let's save our, let's save our national government. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. You know, we, we, we decided to get together as a collective group, and we were selling all of our, all of our pieces of jewelry that we could possibly just sell so that the government could have the gold that we, that we have. And with the U.S., though, I mean, everybody, I mean, we're one of the most prideful countries in the world. That's that's given. I mean, I really feel like um, this was one in education at least. It said that we were one of the bottom five countries in math and science, but we're the top five, one of the top five in confidence. <laughs> and so um, it was very ironic how that played out. But um, I really feel like if the U.S. really the people got together and start to realize, look, like like Daniel was saying, there, it's a, it is a bigger underlying problem. Like like he was saying, I think if we could get together and start realizing some of this and stop being so greedy. If we can try to help each other and get out of this together, then yeah, the, I think the U.S. has a chance to rebound. But you know, none of the, the citizens want to help out the federal government. They don't want to bail them out. I mean, we we need to help each other to get out of this. But it's just me, me, me. Let's let's worry about my end. Let's worry about his end. We need to make profit. Let's make profit. And then, like you said, you throw out ethics out the window. Yeah. And then it I sounds like socialism I, to me. <laughs> uh, we're not talking socialism. Like even Warren Buffett, uh, he wrote an article in the New York Times just a few days ago, and he yeah. said, "Hey, why are you not taxing the super rich?" I talked to my friends and. They don't mind paying extra ca extra taxes. W what's the matter? Why? And I'm making sixty percent on fifty. Uh, I'm making six percent of my investments. I'm only charging. I'm only being charged fifteen percent tax. Even Warren Buffett says, "Hey, pass the pain around. Everybody's in pain right now. Uh, you can you can charge us a little bit more." The guy has an eight million dollar tax bill, and it's only fifteen percent of his wages. Mm -hmm. But whereas yeah. uh, he could. You tack on like he, like he said he's uh, in his office. Everybody pays thirty between thirty five and forty percent. He's paying fifteen. Yeah, as a percentage, I think he said he pays less tax than his cleaning lady. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> Adam, did you want to jump in? But well, just like Charles said, I mean it, that's the, I've heard the Korean story, and that's the really really interesting. But if you go back to the very beginning, talking about the debt deal between the Democrats and the Republicans, and it just took so long, and it kept going and kept going and continued, and no, no, we're not going to we're not going to agree, we're not going to agree. You know, if they would have sat down and actually hammered something out, and instead of arguing for the sake of arguing, you know, they they might have been able to slow down the process a little bit, actually had a better deal in place and, and done it instead of waiting for the 11th hour and watching it implode. Well, it's political actually, there, there's another yeah. aspect too in that. I, 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 sorry, uh, can we get Stafford in here? So, yeah, it's political posturing more than anything else, isn't it? 
I mean, in the end, um, they they were well, they agreed pretty much to everything that the Republicans wanted. They were quite happy. Um, no, I mean, I, not I, all I happy though. Well, no, I mean the Republicans were happy. No, I I agree. Um, this this sort of um, it dragged on far too long. And I wonder if um, President Obama couldn't have done something more immediate in terms of like a, a you know a um, a presidential order or something, just to nix it to to get it through and done and perhaps avoid some of this i, I don't want to get too deep into uh what's wrong with america because that's just going to yeah. take a lot longer than an hour but yeah. you know daniel was ta uh, i'm sorry charles was talking about how greed was behind a lot of this and not working together i also see in both america and korea sort of an excessive aspirational component to this the fact that people want to have a quality or standard of living beyond their their income warrants and so that's where you get high household debt, household debt that's man. where you get you know and, and the system plays into that by providing loans that people shouldn't be getting and that was you know a huge part of the u.s downturn a couple of years ago was the housing crisis i feel like something very similar is going to be happening here because i know in our apartment complex there's all sorts of people who bought their places for 10 percent down and probably should not have been getting loans. They were thinking, well, it's an investment. Housing is going up, up, up. I'll make a lot of money and sell it in two years. Has any of this started to affect the housing market? And I know we, it's hard to tell what's going to happen, but how do you think it will play out in terms of, of housing here in Korea? They've been talking about a bubble for the last five years, but you know, it, you get these mm -hmm. mortgage-free, you get these interest-free loans, right? Or uh, the principal-free, sorry, you've only paid the interest for two years. And the government just renewed that uh, about a year ago or eight months ago. They extended that, that time period again. And it's just at some point in time, the government's going to have to stop, you know, supporting all of this, this buying. and I Adjusted rate mortgages. That is the mortgage that killed America. <laughs> yeah. It's the arms. That, uh, I, told, I told SK Chemical when I was working for them, I was working at the VP level. I told them back in 2006, Wall Street had just made record profit. And I said, why are you guys making record profits? And then I looked into it, and it's all these mortgages, these toxic mortgages. And it, I said, this is going to blow up in everybody's face. Oh, and I definitely I, I said in 2006, I told all the VPs in 2006. In 2008, everybody exploded. One of the VPs remembered me. He said, he said okay, I want, I, I'm going to hire you for my, as my business, as my partner. It's just that's what happens. It's just it's an, it's mean, a nasty thing. It's like they, those arms, they're, they're horrible because mm -hmm. there's no underlying principle. They're, people are going to lose their houses. Sure, and they just changed I, the rules too, right? Construction companies. Sorry, Charles. Construction companies are now allowed to rent out those apartments where previously they weren't allowed to. Yeah. So, Charles, mm -hmm. sorry. Well, uh, what I was gonna say. I mean, yeah, what uh, what Jeff was saying before. Koreans have a tendency to be, they want to live a luxurious lifestyle, obviously. But I, I really feel like, I mean, it's just, I think that's just the Korean mentality. We're very, the people are very superficial. They're, they're, they like to be, if it's a luxury brand, they need to get their hands on it. If she has it, then I must have it. This whole min mindset, yeah. as, a, as a, I think it's just the Korean mindset. I really believe so. Uh, I mean, it's not just a Korean mind. I'm living in Lotte Castle right now. It's, <laughs> it's everybody's mind. <laughs> <laughs> and and I mean, it's not, extent. <laughs> it's not even just the housing loans. I really feel like um, the Korean student loans. If you feel oh. like before we they weren't allowed to go with student loans, but now they're giving out all these student loans. Hey, if you need to put yourself to college, I mean, one of the biggest issues with, with America right now. I mean, President Obama paid off his law school loans back when what his second year into office. I mean. You're sitting there going, look, I'm paying back my loans for the rest of my life. These guys, I mean, of course, granted, tuition isn't that high out in, a compar in comparison with the United States. But well, you've got, you've got, well, yeah, that's relative, I mean, compared to, but also. Well, compared to, to American private universities, that's what I wanted to get at. American public universities are cheaper than Korea's, I believe. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking public universities. You know, yeah. like University I went, of Chicago. I went to a public state university. I went to SUNY Binghamton, and okay. I mean, we we have one of the lowest tuitions throughout. But um, no, I really feel like because uh, I think one of the highest tuition rates right now in Korea is probably Ewa Women's University, and they're about a thousand. Uh, I mean, a thousand, uh, ten million won. Yeah. So, a semester. Well, yeah. 
That's that's twenty thousand. That's twenty thousand. That's twenty million won per year. Well, yeah. the thing is, see, I, I really want to say just that's well, once again. But Ewa Women's University is a private university, though, right? Right. So, right. but Seoul National, I mean, they're public. So I think they're roughly what is it like five mil? I think something like that per yeah. semester. Yeah. No. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, no. Okay. No. Who's, is it who's more on, than that? Pusan National University is uh, about five thousand dollars for the year. Oh okay. wow! Yeah, so five thousand, six thousand dollars for the year. Okay. So uh, Osan wow. University, which is a private, back. it's five million a, a semester. Hmm. So it's ten million a year for Osan University. Um, I, just saw, I just read an article about how a student, you know, he had to drop out of you know, college after he took out all these loans and his, well, you know, to, yeah. to put himself through college, and then, you know, I mean, all these like horror stories. I really feel like these are so sad. You know, all these. You know, we have the bright minds of our future generations graduating out, getting trying to get jobs, but they can't even finish their schools because you know it's too expensive for them. And taking well, out yeah. these loans, they're going to put them under. We get that in Canada too, and really in Canada, our tuition's not that high. But you know, I mean, I had thirty-five thousand dollars in in loans when I graduated. Mm-hmm. It took me I twelve years 40. to pay it off. <laughs> I had forty when I graduated. Yeah, and, you I'm know, still paying mine. Well, there you go. <laughs> You know, um, one of, right one of the problems. You. One of the problems here in Korea, I find, is that they've never had to really pay that before. So it's it's a more of a shock than anything. Oh my God, I have loans. I have to get a job. Oh, I have to work to pay my tuition. Well, you know, welcome to Western style education. <laughs> really, <laughs> you know, I had a part time well, job through school, and you know, <laughs> only one. Sucks to be me, I guess. But you know, <laughs> I drove taxi while I was in school. <laughs> nice. Oh, I sold sports equipment. So. You know. <laughs> so. I, I've been trying to get uh, Hyung Sheik into the Hangout. He's having some technical okay. issues once again. Uh, and I especially want him to sort of be on board for our next topic. But let's go ahead and uh, segue into that now. Uh, there were a number of union-related stories uh, in recent weeks, uh, starting with uh, SC. Who can frame uh, the SC story for us, Stafford or Adam? Uh, Stafford, would you like to, or do you want me to go? All right, ahead? you know, I'll give it a go. Um, okay. So Standard and Chartered, not to be confused with Standard and Poor's, uh, <laughs> is um, Standard and Chartered first has decided their management that um, the workers, the bankers, the bank tellers, the bank managers uh, will be paid uh, based on performance. So they'll be introducing a performance pay scheme into the into the company. Um, and um, this is in contrast to the current situation at SC where you know, people are paid in terms of their seniority and how long they've been working there and how old they are. Um, and um, obviously the union that um, is behind the bank tellers and the bank managers um, has decided that this is not a good thing um, and have gone on strike. Sure. I agree with the union. I, I, re- I agree with the uh, going on strike. The reason being... Here in Korea, a guy wants to do performance, which means he has to do some risks. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of bosses are: Is it going to hurt? Is it going to work? It's are you? Do you know what the hell you're doing? Do you? I don't know if the, I don't know if, if the countries, the corporations, are ready to for performance-based uh, pay. Not I, from where I worked from, from the companies I've worked at. Uh, if you want to take initiative, you want to do things, uh, you're the nail that's sticking up, and they, what usually happens with the nail that sticks up? Thump, 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 thump. <laughs> back down. Sure. sure, but if they want to play globally, there's going to have to be some change. I, I don't really agree with the wholesale walk in and make this change right away. Because just, I mean, it, if you go back to the 80s, that's why so many businesses failed in Korea, because there was no acceptance of local culture and local business practices. Yeah. I, you know, just walking in and saying, we're going to pay by performance. Well, yeah, of course people are going to be angry about that. You don't walk in and tell me what to do, right? There should have been some sort of, you know, slow entry of performance-based ideas. So there's some sort of concept of that while still maintaining, you know, experience and, and longevity. Because, I mean, in Korea, you're the younger guy. You get a promotion over an older guy. That's, there's a conflict there. there it's a major conflict. conflict. Yeah, but this also easy. reminds me, Adam, of what you were mentioning a few weeks ago about uh, Korean women working for international companies, where yeah, they're yeah. still getting paid uh, 60 cents to the dollar, or 60% yeah. of what men typically get paid in Korean companies, mm-hmm. and a lot of international companies are 
hiring them and they are rising faster through the ranks? Absolutely. And, well, they're getting the opportunities, right? I mean, it, it's still like you go back to that culture based idea, right? The women are going to get pregnant and they're going to quit and they're going to stay home. Well, international companies are taking that risk based on the fact that they can pay them less. But, you know, you're finding you have an equally intelligent uh, workforce here that isn't being hired as predominantly by Korean companies. So, so they're walking in and they're hiring these people and then giving them these bonuses, right? So it is one way to sort of get around what SC is trying to do, really. I mean, they're promoting a class that normally doesn't get promoted, essentially. Yeah, essentially you've got 50% of the workforce that is underemployed, yes. albeit with that, that uh, risk of them getting pregnant and, and, and quitting. But, you know, soak up the workforce when you can, and that's what these foreign companies are doing. Absolutely. And speaking of what foreign companies are doing... I, I, I keep remembering one of my friends. She has uh, a master's degree in electrical engineering, and she's running... A hot one. <laughs> Speaking of what foreign companies are doing in Korea, uh, this week on Korea Business Central, there was an interview with um, Tom. What's his name, Charles? Tom? It was Tom Brown. Thank you, Tom Brown, who is a director of Home Plus, Tesco, here in Korea. Mm -hmm. And they've certainly taken a, a, a different approach. Well, not, I don't know about a different approach, but their approach has been very successful. Uh, Charles is the expert in that piece. What can you tell us about that discussion? Well, I'm not really an expert, but uh, <laughs> well, from, from what I read, um, I know that Home Plus and all the big retail markets are, you know, I know that uh, Walmart came in and I don't think they succeeded too well. Um, but, you know, the way Home Plus strategically, they, they decided to do a joint venture with Samsung back in the 1990s. And obviously, Samsung is, Korea, I mean, I think it, it wouldn't be an overstatement, but Samsung is Korea's pride. I mean, if you, I mean, I talk to my kids and I say, you know, what, re what would globally represent Korea? They all say Samsung because they're all like, we're so prideful in this one company and even LG. But, you know, I think Samsung has a, big, a bigger global image and when you go ahead and say, you know, um, we're going to go in with this company that all the citizens trust, because I know that even the government subsidizes them, you know, so, I mean, you're thinking, okay, let's go ahead and trust, let's go ahead and join, uh, do a joint venture with the company that the Korean, the local citizens trust, and let's go ahead and start a market with them. And, you know, and I think that really was a very, very good approach. And so Home Plus came in, of course, and, you know, later on, they did buy out Samsung. Uh, Tesco did buy them out. But, I mean, that, that mindset, the fact that you did come in joint with a different company, I mean, E-Mart, Chinsege, that's a very, very well-known uh, local image. I mean, that brand itself is very, very popular as a department store, and then you've got all of their, you know, subsidiary companies. But, I mean, you have Tesco, you've got this one, you know, European company, who's, uh, what are we going to do? How do we get in this thing? Walmart says, let's just go in there, let's start this. Mm -hmm. We're Walmart. Everybody's going to know us. They do it. People don't know them. What the hell is going on here? Why are we not succeeding? And then Tesco decides to open up Home Plus with Samsung and says, hey, let's go ahead and do this together. And so they actually put Tesco and Samsung, their global brand name, with, with the, the Home Plus image. But now, as they, bought, as they decide to buy out Samsung, and then Tesco decides to remove their logo as well, and now it's just the Home Plus image. And so I think they were able to get themselves assimilated right into the culture a little bit by coming in through that channel. And so they were able to get, I mean, they, that's why I think they were able to enter the Korean market very successfully. Um, Absolutely. I, I had no idea Home Plus was actually owned by Tesco for, you know, a little while after shopping there. I'm like, oh, oh wow. It's not Korean. Well, interesting. Right. So. And right. And so I, and I, had, I didn't even know that they did a joint venture with Samsung. I, yeah. I knew that they were Tesco. I know that they were a subsidiary company of Tesco, but I'm saying they're going, Samsung? Really? I mean, I've heard of Renault, Samsung, their cars, but yeah. really? A, a Mart? Samsung? Yeah. Really? And I had no idea. But then, I mean, I, I looked deeper into the story and it was amazing. I'm sitting there going, wow, Samsung really, wow, you were very bold. <laughs> Did anyone Just see, uh, also on Korea Business Central, someone posted a video of how Home Plus marketed their online shopping, and apparently they put up these big boards in subways where yeah. people could kind of do their, start doing their shopping or their browsing. Looked totally cool. I never saw one. Did anyone actually see it's one? It's a fantastic commercial. Like, really fantastic. These guys just sitting there looking at this big board in the Seoul subway station, you know, pointing out stuff on the, on the, on the wall. I'm like, this is, this is really neat. Yeah. 
So uh, it's not in Pusan, so I, uh, a little disappointed, but that's okay. More ubiquitous shopping, <laughs> just what the world needs. Get that economy going again. Yeah, but you can you can order it there, and they'll deliver it to your house. And of course, you and then you run with you run with this story, and of course, there's the problem of the you know David versus Goliath, the mom and pop shop that you know are they really be, are they socially responsible for those little mom and pop super the little local marts and I mean I think that because I know on the discussion board someone left you know I, this was a, it left a nasty taste in my mouth and you know it just opened up this big Pandora's box for this you know art this this conversation I guess um, I mean anybody else have any uh, comments about that? I think the, the biggest problem is I wish Korea would stay a little bit by themselves. I remember my dad, my grandfather, he lost his store to the big boxes back up in northern Ontario. Uh, but that was back in the 1960s. And it, it it's the same thing in Korea. Like, it's just 40 years later, 50 years later, Korea is losing the mom and pop stores. Uh, and what's going to happen if you go to the mom and pop stores? Because these po mom and pop stores support its families. Employee, if you have one a cashier or a, a, a stock boy just filling up the shelves, can he support a family? No. He can support himself, maybe. Can he support a family? No. So that's why I really, I'm, I'm sad. Personally, I'm sad. Well, sure, I'm uh, sad. I don't, but... I don't like home. I don't like the big boxes. Well, you, everybody can be sad. I mean, it's always sad stories. But the, the moment you can tell people to stop being price sensitive and stop worrying about convenience, you know, well, all the mom and pops will come back. But you know, it, it's the nature, I guess, of progress and the way people are more concerned with choices and prices and the, those kind of things. It's got nothing to do with being international or anything. But you know, you know, it's it's very similar with what you know, Walmart is often accused of as far as killing mom and pop, but also because they're so anti-union and really don't have a very good reputation for treating their employees well. How is Home Plus's mm -hmm. reputation for amongst their employees? I haven't heard that they're unionized. I suspect they're not. Um, are they regarded as not only killing mom and pop, but then hiring mom and pop and paying them unfair wages? I mean, that's, that's the word on the street, I guess. Um, but uh, realistically, the way I see it, especially with the economic downturn, all, all the, I mean, all the consumers are going to be very, very um, weary of what's going on, especially with the prices. I know that you said not to be price sensitive, but with the economy, I mean, if consumer uh, prices are going up by 4.6%, I mean, how do you not go, I mean, obviously as a consumer, you're going to want to buy the cheaper goods. If mom and pop over here is selling their, you know, their eggs at, you know, 4,001 and I go to E-Mart and they're selling like four dozens at 4,001, well, obviously I'm thinking, hey, maybe I should go to the bigger mart because my wage hasn't gone anywhere because I obviously, you know, that's the same. The average income is about 3 million won or even less than that maybe in Korea. My wage hasn't gone anywhere. It's not, it's not rising according to inflation and yet here I am having to purchase things that have gone up with my, with my wage. So obviously I'm going to be sensitive. And so, I mean, people are going to be looking for, you know, looking for these big marts that are, because they're able to buy it in bulk. And, you know, they're about, they're able to sell it cheaper because that's what they're doing. They're mass producing. So, I mean, if I were a consumer, I'd definitely pick a mart over a mom and pop. I know that brand loyalty, all of this, it plays into a factor. Um, do I really care about, you know, my neighbor who's got the mart? Yes, I do. But you know what? She's not the one taking care of my wallet. So. It really, really comes down to consumers. I really feel like that's what um, really, really did, uh, drives my my choices. I mean, and at the market, you do have a bigger selection, so I think that might be another reason why. I, I, I sometimes wonder about that, too, because, like, with the mom and pops, you know that, there's, that the produce, at least... I look at the West... I look at Canada and America, and we, I, we look at all the different little... Uh, all the shit products on the markets, like all the high fructose corn syrups and everything else. Mom and pop, they sold fruits and vegetables, and they sold the, the local milk, local fruits, local vegetables. These stuff are healthy, whereas the the big chains they buy it from the big farms, and the big farms they don't care what the what the what the quality is. Uh, traditionally, we use just people as a people as a humanity. They used to spend 50, 75 percent on their food. Now we spend maybe 10% on our food, and I think people have to realize that hey, you're gonna get you're gonna get what you pay for. 
if you pay for shit, if you pay low price, you're not going to get the price prices either. But 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 that's why I really feel like Tesco did a great job because um if you I mean because that's what the interview was about. He said that he does go ahead and purchase from a local farmer. I mean, it's not just from these major corporations that they're buying the produce and fruits from. Um, they are employing and they are uh, selling the local goods that the, the farmers in the local area are providing. And so I really feel that that's why Home Plus actually had a very good transition into the cream market because that's one of the ways they decide to remedy that. Um, yeah, we're, we're buying, you're, you're paying for, you know, you're paying low prices for low quality stuff. But as, on the flip side, if you go and say, hey, look, we're not. We're offering far, you know local goods that local farmers in the area. We're we're gonna have, we're going and buying up these things and we're selling it at our mark. I mean, and I think that's what really really uh, developed consumer confidence, and that's why Home Plus actually has a very good image. Um, Emart, on the other hand, yeah, they, they 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 bring things from God knows where. I mean, obviously, origin is very important, but I mean, we don't know. It just says Kuksan, right? It just means domestically it's from somewhere, but it could be from a, a, a company in Korea that's mass producing somewhere, and they're just putting on an assembly line or putting on a conveyor belt and boom, 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 produce them and then sell them to Emar. But Home Plus decided to actually announce this and say, look, we actually go ahead and buy things from our local vendors, and that's why we're putting it on our shelves. And I think that's what really developed this brand image of being a very successful company. That's very interesting. I, I'd be interested to learn more about... Uh food laws and reforms here in Korea. I, I'm appalled by some of the food policy of the United States. Uh, I just did want to mention in the chat room, Stephen mentions that the uh, employees have to dance in the aisles a couple times a day. And I would just suggest a Home Plus and every other store, if you're going to kill mom and pop store and hire them for less money, please don't make them dance or sing in the well, store. It just makes they, me so uncomfortable. They, they play I think that's a beautiful thing. I, I do too. They, they play a song and then they all line up at the front of the aisles and they bow and they smile and they sort of do a little jig. And, you know, it, it's it's kind of cool if it's, you're there at that time, I think. I think it's a little bit of community effort. Like uh, I was working in a company with nine and a thousand employees. Eight o'clock every morning, everybody lined up and they all did their calisthenics. Yeah, it's a cool thing. How would you guys feel at your place of work if they say, "Oh, it's ten o'clock, time to clap and sing your song"? Exactly. I don't. I, I would agree with it. Hey, it gets me off my chair. Gets me to do a little bit of exercise. I could lose a little bit of weight. <laughs> um, I have a quick question though. Uh, Especially with these big marts, I know that, I mean, there was, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware with the whole Lotte Mart chicken incident, right? I'm sure you're aware, aware of that. Hey, can you, what for those who aren't, can you business? tell us about that quickly, what it was? Well, Lotte Mart decided to sell their bucket on a bucket. And of course, I mean, you're getting, you know, you're getting the same amount of chicken as your local, you know, BBQ chicken or your Kyochun chicken, but you're paying close to a third of the price. And so... Um, the chicken vendors in the local area or the franchises, those big franchises decided to get together and say, hey, you know, they're hurting our business here. You know, if these big guys are coming in and selling the chicken at, you know, 5,000 won, because they can, because they can buy it in bulk. And if they're selling it at 5,000, and we're, I mean, obviously you're taking all of our customers away. Um, I really felt like, you know, that really, that, that exploited, you know, in a sense, by standing up and saying this, they exploited themselves. Because I know that when they when it went into the national assembly, um, the price of a, a whole chicken was only less than three thousand won, and so now they were actually under fire. Like, wait, what? A, a price of a whole a whole chicken is three thousand won, and yet you're charging fifteen? Wait, what? Wait, it's actually these guys are the better guys. They're selling it at five. What's going on? Um, I, I mean, I really thought this was a very big one, and then. Um, I don't know why the chicken sale ended, but how come Emart is able to continue their pizza? And then Lotemart caught on and started to sell their big pizzas. How come the pizza vendors aren't doing anything going? Like, they're not uprising and saying, hey, we need to fight this. I don't understand why your local Domino's and pizza is not standing up and fighting this either, you know? They, I mean, they decided to mimic Costco's pizza, but yet the chicken disappeared. But the pizza didn't. I didn't know why this was a big. I, I think I pizza is it's just the fact that pizza is a Western food. Nobody cares about Western foods. Chicken <laughs> is a part of the culture. Pizza is not part of the culture. Yeah. <laughs> there was a report about fried chicken in the World Cup, right? I mean, the World Cup made fried chicken famous in Korea, so, you know. <laughs> of course they get together. They have all the star power, too, right? BBQ chicken with uh, 
who who's that? Sonia Shide and then Sonia you Shide, know, yeah. You got yeah. Kara doing somebody else's chicken and you know <laughs> oh, hey, Korean chicken cool. wars. Uh, <laughs> so funny. we're coming up to an hour here. Uh, any other odds and ends stories people would like to mention? Well, I mean, we can throw in the Hanjin story that I was saying before. I mentioned earlier because uh, um, yeah. because I really want to get to the EC and the Sea of Japan. I really want to get to that topic because I mean, as a Korean. <laughs> American, foot, I know that you know. Pole. Not touching that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I want. I wanted to get to that because you know that definitely would have gotten something started. But um, mentioning, you, we were talking about unions earlier, and so um, I know that SC and their unions, they were doing, they were going crazy with their unions right now. They were saying how the unions are very stubborn. But I mean, we've got a very big crisis on our hands with the Hanjin uh, the shipbuilding company, and you've got these guys and their unions. That, you know. They, they laid off close to 2,000, I believe, or something like that. I, they, they laid off all their laborers, and um, in the on the bigger picture, they're moving. I think they're outsourcing. That's what they're doing. They're laying off Korean workers and hiring all the workers over in the Philippines. Now, I heard that the union had agreed to those layoffs. Is that true? Now, that's where, um, if because there's a show called, I believe it's something 60 Minutes. Uh, there's a very It's a very controversial show. These guys always pick the hot issues, and they, they decide to do coverage on them. But the the labor union leaders agreed to this. Now, only problem is those guys they they're gonna they're gonna get paid well regardless of the situation. They're gonna be the ones holding hands with the management. They're the ones overseeing the labor union. So but there's no union vote. The, see, and that's why if you because because this was really an interesting topic. You you saw the labor union leaders walking pr with protection because the labor the labor uh, union members. We're going at them. They were about to, you know, they were trying to get violent and physical and get hostile with the leaders. They, how the hell did you agree to that compensation package when you, we had no say in this? You went and agreed to it, and they were about to go ahead and like kill him. I mean, really, they were about to go ahead and murder the guy because he agreed with the management, held hands. I'm sure, you know, there was a lot of, you know, underlying, you know, maybe money going back and forth. But nonetheless, the union members got screwed. And they are lose. They are out. You know, they're lost. They're at a loss with jobs now. Uh, and of course, the Philippine, the Philippine workers, the Filipinos, they're going and, and actually protesting this as well because they know that um, they're all, they're a part of a good big union. You know, they're part of a group here. They're all workers. And I know they were protesting and saying, "Hey, look, if Korean, if that happened to Korea, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It's not going to happen to us." And so they're actually supporting the union uh, members here in Korea. And they're protesting over there, and the CEO came out and said, "We're sorry. Um, this was an, it was inevitable. We couldn't we couldn't avoid it. It had to be done." But then, you know, obviously this actually opened up this big. It exploited this huge, I guess, corrupt corruption. I guess that's what we can call it. And now he's in the National Assembly, and Congress is just firing. You know, they're just chewing him up, saying, "Really." I believe that according to Korean law, or even just morally, you should have exhausted all other forms of, you know, compensation, just ways to save your company. And yet here you are saying you guys get stock options, you didn't liquidate some of them to save your company. Wait, what? You, wait, you, you gave yourself increases in wages here, but yet you're laying off these guys. That wasn't the last option. You should have found other ways. No, no, no. And that's why he actually came out and publicly apologized. And the offer that he made was if the company comes back to its original standing then he would hire those guys back but that still doesn't mean currently those guys are still unemployed it doesn't it doesn't solve the current situation that they're without a job it just means that they're he's just giving them hope that you can come back work for the company later. was the layoff because of a slowdown in business or because of automation well as of right now i mean i'm not I don't know deeply into their books. That's not, oh, you know, obviously nice. I didn't take a look at their books yet. Uh, but uh, the thing was, uh, I believe that they were supposed to go ahead and, I mean, they, they overspent on a lot of their projects. They, they, I guess they, they spent too much, they invested in things that didn't turn out well. Um, back in the 90s, their company, they were doing well, but then all of a sudden 30 other companies came up and started sharing that market. So their investments weren't as profitable as they thought they would be. Their profits were lower, but at the same time, their wages stayed the same, and the up, and you know, in the hundred thousands, and all these guys are paying a lot. But I believe that's kind of the reason why they were supposed to get paid in stock options, because then you can help, because you're that's why you're a manager. You know, your your job is to help the company here. 
but I mean, they were getting greedy and they were trying to cover their rear end. They were trying to save money for their own pockets. And then you screwed over the guys at the lower end of the pyramid. And that's why now they're protesting. And, you know, the, the bus of hope, the Himankos, that's yeah, why yeah. that bus was going around. But, yeah, basic business also stipulates that if you can save in those labor costs, though, I mean, you're, you're, you, you stand to make more money. I mean, uh, lots of manufacturing is leaving Korea. It's, it's very sad. And if you're emotionally attached, it sucks. You know, which is why Congress or whatever, you know, is going after them. Because, yeah, they wasted money. Yeah, they, you know, corrupt. Sure, whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, it's cheaper to build the, the ships in, in the Philippines or in China or in Vietnam instead of in, in Korea. And it's unfortunately, you know, a fact. The problem is in, in Vietnam and China and Philippines, the product is not quite as good as in Korea. Koreans, the engineers... I'm sorry about those other countries, but Korea and here in Ulsan, the expertise ah, built up North over the years. The expertise built up in, over the years here. I know guys, I, I'll give you an example of cutting costs over experience, cutting costs over quality. SK built, uh, there was a ref the refinery fire in Kuwait. The world said it would take at least a year. I was insurance companies saying it would take at least a year to 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 fix this all up and get it back online. SK people who were who were told not to fire their employees in the late nineties, who were told specifically no firing. They had the guys. They went in. They fixed that place. They because of experience, because of working together for a long time, they fixed that place in six months under budget on time, and. That's what happens when you you cannot always look at the short term. You have to look at long term. In terms of business, you always got to look at, to a certain degree. A business is about people. A country is about people. Well, isn't the market that supposed to take people. care of that? Have, I mean, if they're producing people. inferior goods, the well, market's yeah. going to recognize that and say, oh, you know what? We want to go back to Korea because they build better ships. And well, they yeah, but can bali bali tap a fire. But it takes time. It's like right now. You, uh, Chinese products are all shit. Sorry. Uh, are they going to go back to America and start making toys in America? Nobody knows how to make toys in America. Nobody knows how to put toys together at a cheap cost. But let's not assume that Hanjin's stupid. I mean, they're they're obviously they're obviously aware of some of these other issues, like in Ulsan and SK and the things that you mentioned. But they're they're obviously not idiots. I mean, maybe it's poorly handled, but they they saw an opportunity, they took it. You know, whatever. Short-term short, short -term opportunity over long-term growth. Possibly. But, you know, I really feel like it was a matter of... Uh, it, I mean, it's something that all these, I think, corporations have to go through eventually. I mean, if it's at, if it's at that level. I mean, I know that Hyundai, they went through it all in the 80s. I mean, they went through all of this in the 80s, and now they're at their current standing. And and obviously, um, still Daniel, who lives in Ulsan... They, I mean, sure they go through it every summer in Ulsan. Yes. A, they do the yearly contract. It's a yearly contract, and it's, it's practically a yearly strike. <laughs> right, but you know what, though? They're always able to come to terms, you know? And that, it, I think it's just, it just a, rep, a, a repetition of just practice and eventually getting on, uh, on a good... Us on the same page, on the same ground, but you know all these other companies, even Samsung or any of these big conglomerates, they're not familiar with it yet because they haven't gone through it. And I just think that right now it's Hanjin on the chopping block who's going through this now. And once they go through it, I'm sure it'll be you know the next company who has you know internal issues and labor issues, and they'll be on the chopping block because you know eventually the, the the strikes will happen over there if they're unsatisfied, and then it'll happen throughout all the others. And I think it'll just take time. All right, well, stay tuned to this show for more news on Hanjin. Charles, your assignment is to get into those Hanjin books and let us know what's really going on uh, and report back. Uh, before we wrap, Stafford, I just want to check with you if you had any stories you wanted to toss in here. Um, well, it was very interesting. Um, someone mentioned uh, you know, uh, opportunity, short-term opportunity, long-term gain. Um, it came out this week that uh, Samsung, uh, that we've, we've called... Uh, the, the brand of Korea had um, earlier on in the piece turned down the opportunity to purchase the Android operating system um, for fifty million or something. I think for for yeah. cheap as chips, fifty million. I mean, that's nothing for Samsung, is it? Um, so it turns out that uh, Andy Rubin, um, who is essentially the, the the developer behind Android, um, spent his own money to come to Korea. And um, visited Samsung um, to show off his 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 operating system. 
Um, and apparently, <laughs> dressed in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt, was met by 20 or so Samsung executives all in their shiny grey suits and their pink ties. Um, and um, Samsung turned them down. Um, whether, whether it would have meant that in the long term Google turned around and bought Samsung, I'm not sure. Um, with obviously news this week, Google buying Motorola. But um, it's one of those very interesting historical what-ifs. Absolutely. And would have uh, Android stayed as open? I mean, I think the strength of Android is its openness, and it's so I could have seen it and going the Samsung are locking it down, perhaps. Yeah. So, sure. um, I, I, I think the article makes a good point. Um, would it even have emerged from the bowels of the Samsung building in Gangnam here? You know, would it have stayed sort of an R and D little pet project for a little group? Maybe had one or two phones, and that was it, perhaps. Maybe Mr. Uh, most likely suit and tie. Huh? It would be it. It would be my thinking on Samsung. If Samsung would have bought an Android, it would have been a an office pet project. I don't yeah, think if it you look at um, the the Bada operating system that they have, you know, developed themselves on a few of their phones, um, it's it's pretty rubbish and it's not very widespread. Um, yeah, you, know, you can only imagine Android might have gone the same way. But um, you know, no, yeah, again, Android. I'm I'm not I'm not even quite sure if I like Android. I I I bought a Galaxy S one. Uh, Four months ago, and it keeps it freezes on me at least once a week. Oh. Well, the the term going around now we're talking about Android is one and done, and people are thinking about really going back to the iPhone, especially with the iPhone five supposedly coming out um, in the next sort of four to six weeks, or at least oh. being announced in the next four to six weeks. That's um, I think yeah. the best thing would be I'm going to go to BlackBerry with their QNX, which is really. Uh, uh, nuclear power plant operating system, which is probably, I, I would gather, uh, the best operating system out there. <laughs> Daniel, my wife's uh, Samsung also freezes as well. She's got the Galaxy S1. I got the Google Nexus one, and I love it. It's fantastic. Does it freeze? I, uh, huh? My wife does it freezes. freeze? My no, wife it, does yours freeze? No, no, not at all. Actually, it works really, really well. I've had no problems at all with it. It's kind of <laughs> nice. You know, I, I have the Nexus one, and I've just actually just transferred back to my iPhone for the last week, um, but never had any issue with the iPhone with the uh, Nexus one. Mm. Have a Samsung Galaxy Tab that constantly freezes, though. Yeah. I'm happy with That's my Galaxy. I, I really, I, I, I am praying that Korea will adopt the playbook as fast as possible. Uh, I, I, I think Rim is, is very much on the. Um, on the ropes, as it were, and I don't see BlackBerry going very far in the rest of the world, let alone in Korea. Uh, just some late-breaking news from the chat room. Uh, North Korea's dear leader, Kim Jong-il, has just entered Russia, training his way in. Apparently he has a meeting with Putin scheduled in Vladivostok. Uh, hope he has a nice trip. Any, any, has anyone heard anything about this? Anyone know what's going on? I heard the, the, the latest thing that I heard was that um, North Korea, and well, actually, Russia was pushing North Korea to cooperate in building a gas pipeline and railroads right. from Russia into South Korea and through North Korea. And the, he's really pushing uh, Kim Jong Il to behave himself and uh, allow this to happen. Uh, a very interesting great. discussion on uh, Korea Business Central. Also, I'm 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 not plugging Korea Business Central just because they're our collaborative partner. But there were interesting discussions. Corey posted something about the <coughs> the future of uh, North Korea, and I think in in it he mentioned like possibly being absorbed into China. So an interesting discussion there. Uh, we'll have to save the North Korea topic, I think, for next time. Uh, we'll hopefully have some news there. One little item I wanted to toss in here because I'm a bit of a a food. Uh, guy in terms of health and uh, the ramen makers of Korea have voluntarily agreed to reduce sodium in their ramen which is a good thing the maximum amount of sodium dietitians suggest is 2,000 milligrams per day your average bowl of ramen has 2,500 milligrams of sodium uh, your average meal or at a cafeteria they analyze food at an average lunch at a cafeteria 2,700 milligrams of sodium. Korea is number one, leads the world in sodium consumption uh, with 5,700 milligrams, I believe. Uh, so it also has the, what are the I if that's stomach cancer, doesn't it? I believe it does. And I think it, those two are directly related, aren't they? <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree. Well, I think the, the sodium content and the spice content, my grandfather, 
I'm not bashing Korea. My grandfather did the same thing. He ate too many spices. He died of stomach cancer when in his early 60s. Uh, I think Korea is the same thing. They do they do a lot of stomach cancers because hey, just too many spices. Uh, my wife eats spices every day, every day. And Young Cheek in the chat room is already saying this is not good news. No salt in ramen, no taste. And the Absolutely. same thing. I was always pushing my wife to try this healthy ramen, healthy ramen. And she's like, uh, "No, why that's, bother?" That's no good, Jeff. That's no good. Huh? <laughs> How can you not yeah. eat a you know, nice salty Dwin Jung Chige? You know, some Absolutely. salty goodness in there. And it's interesting because I, my trainees just got back from America, and their comment about the food they ate in all the restaurants there, it was so salty. Which is true. A lot of the big chain restaurants, you know, the Olive Gardens and Red Lobsters or whatever, put a lot of salt in food uh, because apparently we humans like that. Yeah. I, I, I think we can't. It's, it's also unavoidable. I think it's, <clears throat> it's just the culture. Um, you've got the side dishes. Um, I mean, rice itself has sodium. Um, you've got our, our jjigae muna, the culture that we've got with the, the, the stew on the side. That's always been, uh, you know, kimchi jjigae or jinjang jjigae or any kind of, you know, solong tang. You've got this this culture, and, and and obviously that's really unhealthy for your stomach because you're not supposed to be having. That's why people say you should be drinking water 30 minutes, whatever after your meal, blah blah blah. After mm. you know, you should it should be solids first, and then liquid, and blah 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 for your stomach. But you know, Koreans, they, we we put it all in one. We make jjigae, we make tang, you make this and you make that, and then you've got the overly high sodium content of kimchi, and you've got that in there. Then you've got your ui jangachi, or you've got any of all these other side dishes that have high sodium content. <laughs> oh, I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> it's just one big, <laughs> big bowl of salt. <laughs> 19% of the average daily consumption of sodium in Korea comes from kimchi. FYI. Yes. I just put a PDF in the chat room that uh, has some Is that of those. 90 or 19%? 19. 19. <laughs> 19. I love doing jjigae, jjigae, kimchi. I, can, I eat, I, I live in Ulsan, if, if you guys know anything, uh, in Gyeongsam Namdo, where Ulsan is situated, the kimchi is usually more sour and more and stronger tasting. And so it's like, ugh. ugh. Oh, you've got you've got kimchi in all different parts of the country that all taste different. I'm sure. It's all taste Korea. differently, but here in Gyeongsam Namdo, it's known throughout the country as being the strongest tasting in the strongest. Um, yes, but I know Cholado is supposed to be known for their saltiest because that's where yeah, my family. Yeah. Well, is. fortunately, <laughs> soju, beer, and wine have very little sodium, so maybe we should just have <laughs> a, a sul diet. Uh, uh, wash it down with beer. That's maybe that's right. the reason you, why you men every that? Wednesday night go drinking so that they wash out all that sodium from the system. <laughs> Yeah, so Jeff, you're suggesting that I should uh, change and put soju on my table as, instead of kids. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, why don't we go I'm ahead sure, and wrap I'm up sure for I this week. I'm sure I won't get stomach cancer, but I think I might get liver cancer with that one. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I hope everyone has a very nice weekend, a safe diet, and uh, we'll be back next time. Stay tuned to koreabusinesscentral.com and koreabridge.net. I, I just want to throw in, I am sorry I wasn't here on time. It won't happen again. That's right. We'll talk about your attendance patterns later. Uh, oh, and I did want to plug that koreabridge.com is having a photo contest. So if anyone has some summer photos, more than 300,000 won in cash and prizes. Uh, we have two categories, one for summer photos in Korea, one for travel photos that people uh. in Korea took during their travels. So uh, check cool. that out at koreabridge.net. Thank you very much, participants. Thanks, everyone who has tuned in. Uh, we'll see you next time for Korea News Talk. Thanks for having me.